Okay, welcome everybody. This is a, a Rest in Readings April special. Um, this April, we're very pleased to feature authors from This Is What America Looks Like, which is the book here, the anthology. It's a wonderful anthology of um, fiction, poetry, nonfiction, and all kinds of great stuff from um, uh, the Washington Baltimore area. And uh, we have several writers here to read their work. Um, before we get to that, end of May, we have um, for Rest and Readings, which is the series that um, I'm hosting here, we have Elaine Chu, um, we have Curtis Smith, and we have Catherine Young, end of May. Stay tuned on the Facebook page for uh, dates um, and time for that particular reading. Um, let's see, I, I'd like to turn over to, to Jonah Colson for a few minutes to say a few words about the anthology, and um, then we'll get to the authors. Great, thank you. And thank you, Nathan, for hosting this event this evening at the Rest in Readings. It's wonderful to see everyone. And thank you to the wonderful, wonderful readers of uh, whose work is included in This Is What America Looks Like, Poetry and Fiction from DC, Maryland, and Virginia. I know myself as a poetry editor and Caroline Bach as a fiction editor and Kathleen Wheaton as the president of the Washington Writers Publishing House. We're really, really excited about this anthology. And uh, please look in the chat if you would like to purchase your own very, your own copy of this book. I'll keep putting the links in the chat uh, throughout the evening. We actually have a Mother's Day sale on all books from the Washington Writers Publishing House are available on the website at a wonderful Mother's Day discount. So thank you all the mothers for giving us uh, this discount uh, up until I believe the day or the day after Mother's Day. So thank you all very much. Um, again, this diverse inclusive, inclusive anthology features 111 works from 100 writers in the DC area. And we're just very proud of it. It spans a wonderful different narrative threads within our sort of American history and American culture. And we think that it really is something that everyone should have on the shelf. And I'm very honored and proud to have the writers here this evening and hear what they've contributed and more to the anthology. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nate. Uh, thank you so much to Jonah and to Caroline Bockford for, you know, the immense effort going into this anthology. I know as an editor myself, how much goes into, you know, reading all the submissions, um, you know, collating, you know, um, emailing, getting the work in, in various documents, bios and everything that goes into it. So, um, you know, huge thanks to Jonah and Caroline for that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and get started with the actual reading itself. I will introduce our first reader, who is Marcy uh, Dilworth. And uh, Marcy Dilworth is a recovering uh, finance professional, finally immersing herself in writing. Her flash fiction and short stories have appeared in Flash Flood Journal, Literary Mama, and Writers Resist. She lives in Northern Virginia with her family and their precocious rescue pup, Kirby. Uh, you can find her on Twitter at M. C D H O O uh, four one. Please welcome Marcy Dilworth. Thank you so much, Nathan. That's so nice of you. And really another shout out to Caroline and to Jonah for all the work they did to put the um, anthology together. It's beautiful. And every single work is just a gem. So very much appreciate it. And did you want me to start out with a little bit of the, a preamble about what took place before it got written? All right, um, it's pretty simple. Um, the call went out and I really wanted to be in this group of writers and you know fiction and fiction writers and poets. So I started in early May of 2020. We've been a couple months into the pandemic. Of course, I was thinking, what, what does America look like now? Not just what does it look like? And I was adequately mired in like fear <laughs> and all the changes. So I kind of took my mind elsewhere, like on a higher level, literally. And I thought, what would it look like from above? Um, my favorite bird is a crow. <laughs> so I just put myself in the body of a crow. What would they see? What would they feel? Crows are smart, crows are observant. Um, and they have the added benefit of, you know, kind of the fortuitous Corvid, COVID off by only one uh, letter. So I went with that. So with that, 
I'll read last night's flight. Heat radiates from the orange dust floor, the canyon face, its striated reds pulsing, each parched breath reminding me that this is a desert and I do not belong here. Follow the concave wall past a scrub of grass up to the canyon's crest, and I am hovering shoulder to shoulder with the skittering wispy clouds, looking down on the ridge, its broad swath of brick red, streaks of brown and dirty yellow, scatterings of pebbles and rocks and fine dust. A juicy looking strider bug sidles in a crevice, tempting. An eagle and two flock hawks fly right past me, single file. The eagle nods with military precision, the hawks wink, and the unit flies east towards Las Vegas, 13 miles as the crow flies, a cliche except that I am the crow. And my God, I'm spreading my wings and have never felt so open, so freed. The landscape trundles below me, the eastern sweep of Red Rock Canyon, the startling intrusion of dense suburbia on the edge of desert, more houses, strip malls that hint at cities, and finally a vacant Vegas in the glaring sun. I struggle to make sense of this landmark jumble, an Egyptian pyramid, a fairy tale castle, the New York City skyline, all shrunk and crammed along rivers of road coated with the patina of desert sand. I swoop to pick up an errant French fry from the empty sidewalk, but alas, the Corona joke's on me. It's a yellowed cigarette butt. No easy feasts for corvid creatures like myself, not these days. I'm alone in this space, created for throngs and flocks and crushes. After years of calling my complaints at humans about their noise and crowds and spectacle, it's their pleasure for pleasure's sake that I miss. It strikes me that I could have winged away at any moment. I chose to be among these chaotic beings. I take off, up and up, for minutes or hours, and emerge beneath the tip of the stark crescent moon. Moon, I glide through bright darkness and look for my people. And, and that is it. Thank you so much for letting me read it. And really, Jonah and Caroline, again, thank you for choosing me to be in the book. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for that great reading and also explanation for um, you know, the inspiration behind the piece as well. I love the sense of point of view there. Um, next up, we have uh, Gregory Luce or Luce, <laughs> if you prefer, uh, who is the author of Signs of Small Grace, Drinking Weather, Memory and Desire, Tile and Riffs and Improvisations. In addition to poetry, he writes a monthly column on the arts for Scene 4 magazine. Gregory is retired, is retired from National Geographic, works as a volunteer writing uh, tutor slash mentor for 826 DC, and he lives in Arlington, Virginia. Please welcome Gregory Luce. Thank you very much, Nathan. It's great to be back in the rest of the series. I've, uh, this is one of my very favorite series to either visit or to read in, so I'm thrilled to be back. Uh, so in any case, uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, I certainly want to thank the editors of this wonderful book, Jonah and Caroline, particularly Jonah, who though I'm going to first read the poem that is published here. And uh, it wasn't written specifically for this. I had things kicking around. And when I wanted to submit, I was looking what could sort of, what had I previously written that could sort of fit. And so I submitted the full poem of this, which is longer than what got published. And I'm very grateful that Jonah wanted it and was willing to pull out these three pieces of it that seemed to really work. And we got a better, you know, we got a title that was appropriate. So um, aside from my gratitude about being here at all, I want to really shout out to Jonah for the good, that, that's a, what a good editor really does, not just say yes or no, but really says here's something I might be able to use, let's work on it. So I'm very grateful for that. That's a very rare experience, even in decades of poetry publishing. So anyway, I'm very proud to be here and I'm glad to meet some of the other, uh, some of the other writers in the anthology. So I first am gonna read, um, like I said, this was not exactly inspired by immediate conditions, but I think we sort of retrofitted in a way. Um, 
It's called Proverbs for 2020. And it actually arose out of the fact that I'm like any poet yeah. language. And there's all these weird phrases and sayings and things you hear. And you kind of literally know what it means. But if you just look at the words, sometimes they sort of begin to seem strange. And it's particularly true of the first part. Uh, this is Proverbs for 2020. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. They're behind you, yes, but don't run. Just walk briskly and look ahead. There's a, there's a shadow, it will always be there, but it's harmless as long as you don't fall backward. Second one, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. As you, I'm sure you all know that's a line from Bob Dylan. It blows in your face, whichever way you turn at first, but don't worry, trim your sails, tack into the wind, you'll soon have it pushing you straight along. The life you save may be your own. I don't know exactly where that originally came from, but that's the name of a story by um, Flannery O'Connor. You've heard it a million times, put your own mask on first. No one else can do it for you. At the very least, you have to want it. So that's Proverbs for 2000. Um, and I have a few other pieces, most of them relatively recent, to, uh, to share as well. Um, excuse me a second. Okay, this one, like, like so many people, I've been, um, I've been rather, you know, moved and enraged and just not even always sure what to call it by the violence directed against people of color in our culture, especially young, young or sometimes older, um, um, sorry, um, black men and sort of this helpless feeling and also having to confront the fact that I'm from the South and um, I don't personally actually bear any responsibility for slavery, but I do have some bloodlines that lead back to slavery. I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for some of those ancestors. So um, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this. I've been trying to write more about this, um, just coming to terms with it mostly. Uh, this one's called, this is fairly recent. Like I said, this one's called Coming Into Texas. They came in from the Northeast, my ancestors, and there were big rivers, Tennessee, Mississippi, red to cross, but they did it in daylight, not after dark or hidden in the back of a truck, and they didn't need to swim. They rode in through the tall grass over the red dirt flatland, up and down the rolling hills through luxuriant wildflowers to Grimes in Montgomery counties. I don't know if they brought their slaves or acquired them after settling, but settle they did and soon spread out, putting their slaves to work on the rich land and propagating the Dunhams and the woods down to my mother's mother. My father's route was more circuitous, Puritan Massachusetts to Wisconsin to Indiana to unexpectedly Texas. Whether he flew or drove to Dallas or exactly why isn't certain. Post-war boom work maybe, but putting distance between himself and his broken family is what I believe. Whatever the case, arrived he did and soon met my mother. Thus, I came to Texas. Both gone now, they left me with mingled blood, mixed feelings, and many questions. This next one is a uh, pandemic poem. I've written a couple. Uh, this is sort of this. This one also is, in fact, very recent because we're in this weird stage where things are reopening a little. Not everybody's following the guidelines. Not everybody's vaccinated. Um, so, going outside the house often requires some calculations of risk versus, you know, necessity. So, I had an eye doctor appointment downtown in D.C. a few a couple of months ago, and this um, poem actually describes the, uh, you know describes part of that trip. It's called Alone on the Metro. The car is empty, save for one man sleeping. I'm listening to coal trains after the rain, which soundtracks the mood of this wet day. 
As we cross the Potomac, I scan the Iron Bridge, hoping to see returning ospreys that nest there every year. None yet, so I gaze at the crumpled green-gray surface of the river just below the tunnel, excuse me, just before the tunnel. One more moment to savor this solitude. So one more. And uh, I mentioned uh, I mentioned Coltrane um, in the uh, in that poem. And he, as some of you know, he's one of my like touchstone uh, like artists that I, I write a lot about music. And uh, he, along with a couple of other artists of his stature or like whether I'm writing about them or just listening, they're, it's really powerful to me. They have a tremendous impact on my work, even if it isn't obvious from the content. Anyway, this is a, quite an old poem. This one goes way back to 2001. It's been tweaked a little bit. It's been published a couple of times. Um, and uh, this was possibly the first thing I ever wrote that related to Coltrane. Uh, it's called Train-esque. Um, it's actually dedicated to my partner and very good friend and best first reader who's with us tonight, Naomi. Um, but it's actually dedicated to a friend, uh, some of you may know, poet Maura Egan, who is now living in Rome. But I met her at a party one evening and we had a, well, this sort of describes a little bit about what, what that went. This one's called Train-esque for Maura. The very thought of you after one long evening of talk cascades through my mind like music, like your hair over your shoulders in the flickering candlelight as the breeze grew chill and your voice came warm across the small space between us. Your words too, cascading like notes, like train soloing filigrees around Johnny Hartman's voice, my one and only love. That's it, thanks everybody. It's really, uh, this is a wonderful experience. Thank you all. Greg, thank you so much. That was great. And it's always um, wonderful having you for rest and readings because I think you were uh, at my very first uh, uh, reading in, 20, in 2016, um, I believe February 2016. So um, sort of coming full circle here. Uh, so thanks again for sharing your work. It's always wonderful. Next up, we have Ariel Goldenthal, who lives in Northern Virginia and teaches at uh, George Mason University. Her work has appeared in Tiny Molecules, Moon Park Review, Emerge Literary Journal, and others. Follow her on Twitter at Ariel Goldenthal. Uh, oh, there you are. Um, thank you, Nathan, and thank you to everyone for coming, uh, especially Caroline Jonah for um, producing this wonderful anthology. Um, at the very beginning when the call went out for submissions, I wrote two pieces. One, a sort of depressing fantasy-ish take on uh, climate change. And then this really ridiculous, silly piece that sort of came out of me all at once um, when I was thinking about what it would be like to sort of right from the perspective of an all-knowing narrator who is sitting in a, a family that really represents what families today look like, not the cookie cutter, uh, one couple and two and a half children and a white fence, but multiple layers of marriages and divorces and sort of nuance and complexity. And this uh, sort of silly piece came out. And it turns out that that's more in line with what um, the the anthology needed at that moment. So I'm really honored to have it as part of this piece. So this is minutes from the first family meeting of the vacation. In attendance, 26 people, some related by blood, some half related by blood, some married into the family, some not married at all, some adults, some children, some adults who act like children, at least one child who thinks she's an adult, 28 cell phones. Opening remarks. We would like this to be the only family meeting of the trip, but we recognize that there may be things that need to be discussed with each other, and we request that they are discussed 
directly with the people who need to discuss them and not call another family meeting. We will call another me family meeting if this is not observed. This is the only family meeting that we will have. On the topic of technology, a new proposal is raised. We should designate specific times and places in which people may or may not use electronic devices. Aunt C, who is separated from her husband, but has still chosen to attend the family vacation with him, notes that she is concerned about people playing games and not engaging with the family. She does not mention that engaging with the family will make it more difficult for her to hide the fact that she is planning to move in with her new boyfriend. Uncle L, usually quiet during family meetings because he would rather have not come on vacation at all, proposes that Wi-Fi enabled devices may only be used in secluded places. At least three children remark that we are in the middle of the woods with no cell service and hardly any Wi-Fi, and doesn't that mean that everywhere is a secluded place? My mother remarks that this was the only option within our price range that had enough bedrooms. We all understand that we added an extra bedroom this year because Aunt C and Uncle N are separated but are both attending. Uncle K proposes an addendum. No one may use Wi-Fi if there are more than two people in the room. This is his first family vacation as a single man, having announced his separation from his second husband shortly after the last vacation. They are the second couple to divorce immediately after a family vacation, and I make a note to never get married. T, 10 years old and working to surgically attach his phone to his hand, offers that perhaps it would be better to only use Wi-Fi in public places. So on the topic of Wi-Fi enabled devices, a new proposal is raised no Wi-Fi usage in public places. Many cousins question whether Wi-Fi means all Wi-Fi enabled devices or only applications that use Wi-Fi. R, my step-grandmother and the matriarch, clarifies that this rule does not forbid taking photographs. You may take photographs, but you may not edit them. L likes to label herself as the oldest of the cousins and at 18 years old this year, she is the same age I was on our first family vacation. Holding up her phone for dramatic effect, L wants to know if we can look at group pictures. What if the same person blinks 10 times? What if T makes a face befitting a long bathroom trip? On the topic of bathrooms, a new proposal is raised. We should be respectful of the people whose bedrooms are next to the shared bathrooms. S and his boyfriend are sleeping next to a shared bathroom. This year makes the, marks the first time that S brought his boyfriend and we are all in, attempting to portray the image of a happy family. We unearth decades old arguments, but only in private. We mention our therapists in coded language, talking to someone. Estranged siblings dodge each other in crowded hallways. We do these things until there is nothing left of our family. Then we take a group picture. No one blinks. Nathan, can I just chime in that I loved this piece because it had humor and we were all, uh, we had so many pieces that were so serious and so intense and we have lots of those pieces, but to find humor in a pandemic is a miracle. And I almost want to ask Ariel, are you planning to vacation with these people this summer? <laughs> Um, we were originally going to vacation with people who are quite similar, though not exactly the same as the uh, this is fiction, people. yes. Uh, but I think it's hard to wrangle upwards of four people um, when you only have a few months of uh, who knows whether we'll be vaccinated or not. So time will tell um, as to whether or not I will uh, vacation with enough people to create uh, minutes part two. <laughs> well, I think you have created a a story that not only has that touch of humor, but that talks of all our families in America these days. So it is not silly. It is, uh, it is this intense, funny um, picture of who we are. So thank you, my friend, for submitting this. Uh, and you read so well. Um, I just felt I had to interject that, Nathan. So I will let you Go back to being the host. Oh no, please Inter interject away. Thank you, Caroline and Ariel. Thank you so much for that great reading. Next up, we have Leona Sevic. Um, Leona Sevic is the 2017 Press uh, 53 Poetry Award winner for her first full length uh, book of poems, Lion Brothers. 
Uh, her recent work appears in Birmingham Poetry Review, Four Way Review, and The Rumpus. She is provost at uh, Bridgewater College in Virginia, where she teaches Asian American literature. Please welcome Leona Sevek. Thank you, Nathan. And thanks to Jonah and also to Caroline. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, three just very short poems. Uh, the first one is from the anthology. I always enjoy an anthology uh, because of course there's something for everyone. In this case, I'm gonna return us to, uh, I think a, a darker path though. Um, I did appreciate Ari's departure from that. Um, so I grew up in rural Maryland, uh, just a stone's throw from the Mason Dixon line. And uh, I write a good deal about uh, what it's like to grow up in a rural area uh, with uh, an immigrant mother. So my mother is an immigrant from South Korea. And uh, of course, like many immigrants, she had uh, difficulty finding work uh, in America. She had no language skills. She could not read or write English. She still does not read or write English. Um, and so she worked in a factory for 25 years. And so uh, this poem that appears in the anthology is, uh, it, it actually describes an event from, uh, or several events, I should say, from my, my childhood, uh, one that I shared with my brother. Um, and then I'll read a, a couple uh, short poems that maybe fill in some of the gaps. Blind. Once my brother and I thought she was just a terrible driver. Too many times to count, she'd drive us home from town in darkness. Headlights off, those street lamps were scarce and anyway, didn't reach as far as we needed them to. She drove slowly enough, her hands at nine and three, like they used to teach us. Our road, twisted and dangerous was darker still. And when one of us would shout, turn on your headlights, she'd reach for the knob slowly, shake her head while we howled. I wonder now if she did it on purpose, chose not to see the factory where she worked, the rusted cars stacked on cinder blocks, the broken down houses lining the road. The second poem I'd like to read is actually the title poem from my collection, Lion Brothers. And Lion Brothers is the name of the factory where my mother worked. Um, and um, and I've, I've always, uh, I'm a big fan of Robert Penn Warren and I always admired his poem, like Brothers to Dragons, like Brothers to Dragons. And so I, I love that title and uh, that sort of inspired the, the title of, of this poem. Uh, and uh, the title of the collection, Lion Brothers. Sometimes they sent her home early, her hand bandaged tight where a needle had pierced her. Home from school, I found her curled on the floor watching. She woke early to put on her face before we could see it for what it wasn't, round and smooth and yellow. Her legs tucked under her, she held the mirror in her tiny hand and painted on the jungle colors, blacks and blues. At the factory, she tied tools around her waist, slimmer than any boys, though her arms were knotted in muscles. She climbed up beside the men, four feet above the ground on their vibrating monsters, machines that worked like animals, like pieces of thread cut from the loom and dropped clean, their words gathered around her feet. And for my final poem, just a short one, um, I have relocated to Virginia. And so uh, that was a big change for me. Um, I've been a lifelong Marylander. And so uh, even though our states are uh, contiguous. It's a, it's a different culture here in the Shenandoah Valley. And so um, this is a, a poem from uh, my manuscript in progress. 
And the poem is called Virginia is for Lovers and it's after uh, Henri Cole. How long will it be before I start feeling like this place is our home? Before the strange corners squatting in this house stop gouging my hips? Before our neighbors quit bringing us bread and handwritten notes? Will my new license plate always taunt me with its prescription for love? Everyone says to give it time, as though time were like the sandy bits of kibble I drop at the dog's feet when he's been a good boy. No matter how much I give him, he never mistakes these gestures for his supper. Whining at his bowl, he urges me to follow trodden paths to acknowledge then disregard the anomalies of action and reward. When do I stop holding everything I love like it's broken? Thanks very much. Uh, Nathan, do you mind just one sec? So hi, Leona, I'm a huge fan. Um, I know Greg said he was, Greg's from the South. I'm, I'm not quite sure, Greg, if you said exactly where, but I know you're um, a DC uh, area person now. Leona, I grew up very close to the Mason-Dixon line in Maryland too. I'm from Westminster, Maryland. Are you close by? So Jonah, I'm from Tawnytown. Oh my God. Yeah, I went to Western Maryland College actually. That was my undergrad uh, oh, institution. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, we, we, we should talk. And, and, and you said it like, a lo well, of course, you're local. You say 20 days. Don't say, oh, no. oh my gosh. Awesome. Thank you. Huge fan. Totally great. Hey, hey Jonah, I think I accidentally made you host just now. <laughs> I Ooh, clicked the wrong button. Do I have the magical powers? <laughs> Can you make yourself unhost? I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that either. Maybe I just need to make you host. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to take it from no, here. No, 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 no. There you go. Oh, okay. I'm the host now. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I clicked the wrong button. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> That's what happens if you click the wrong button in Zoom. Everything changes. Not in a good way. Sorry about that. Um, Leona, thank you so much for the great reading. And uh, I, I can relate to your relocation from Maryland to Virginia. I'm in Northern Virginia now, which is not so different from from the suburbs of Maryland, but it definitely is a little bit different. <laughs> and uh, I too can relate. I haven't grown up in Elkett City. Thank you for the great poems. Okay, uh, next up we have uh, Kay White Drew, AKA Catherine White, MD, uh, who is a retired physician uh, specializing in neonatology, the care of ill and premature newborns. Uh, her essays have been published in Grace and Darkness, Hectoen International, um, the Journal of Medical Humanities, and the Maryland Literary Review. She lives in Rockville, Maryland with her husband. Please welcome Kay White Drew. Thank you. Um, whoops. I, uh, sorry, I was having trouble with my lighting a while ago. Anyway, <laughs> I think it's okay now. Um, I wrote this poem early in the pandemic, like uh, last spring, you know, April-ish. And um, I, uh, I belong to a Facebook group of women physicians. And between my own background of intensive care medicine and some of the things that they talked about being, you know, really on the front lines of the pandemic, um, I thought I would write a little bit about that. So um, here goes. Uh, front lines. She looks up from the bathroom sink as she brushes her teeth and frowns. There are new lines around her mouth. The skin under her eyes is the color of plums. Actual bruises bloom on her cheekbones from wearing a mask all day. The few strands of gray hair at the crown of her head have morphed into a sizable clump. Too many to pluck anymore, seemingly overnight. Just over six years out of medical school and three years out of her emergency medicine residency, barely 32, and starting to look old already. She shakes her head a little as she contemplates the plastics cosmetics, plastic cosmetics caddy with its well-used mascaras and stubby eyeliner pencils. 
No eye makeup these days, knowing there will often be tears before she gets home. She applies some lip gloss and then puts in her lucky earrings, the tiny silver roses grandma gave her before she died. Then she brushes her dark hair, ties it back, and smooths it one last time. The first glints of sunlight peek through the frosted glass of the Georgetown apartment's bedroom window. While she pulls on her scrub top, she thinks about her parents who live across the Potomac in Virginia. In their late 60s and retired, healthy except for mom's rheumatoid arthritis on Humira and dad's history of stage one colon cancer, now a distant memory. Her mother still volunteers at the food bank once a week, which she's repeatedly told her is not a good, great idea since she can't really know how well people there are social distancing. Mom persists with the food bank, but misses her choral group practices in her yoga class. Dad misses his weekly basketball with his old friends from work. Fortunately, all of Dad's church activities are virtual now, so at least one of her parents is truly staying home. She made them half beneficiaries of the life insurance policy she bought with the money Grandma left her last year before there was any inkling of a pandemic. Evan gets the other half of the policy if anything happens to her. They've been living together for almost two years now. They were just starting to plan their wedding when the pandemic hit. Evan, he is so sweet, so patient with her tears and her worries and her irritability. When she broke down telling him about the wife and daughter who weren't allowed into the cubicle to be with their COVID-19 infected husband and father as he took his last breaths, he held her and rocked her tenderly, softly singing her a lullaby. Evan, on the editorial staff of a medical journal, gets to work from home. She pictures Horace, their tuxedo cat, pawing him playfully while he composes an email, walking across the keyboard during a video conference, and she's stabbed by a pang of envy. Thank God they don't have kids. She's recently started hearing the faintest ticking of her biological clock, but it goes silent when she thinks of her friend Lauren in Seattle, who had to, had to deliver her firstborn when the outbreak was at its height and there, there a couple of weeks ago. Sadly, Lauren couldn't have her mother or even her husband with her while she gave birth. What if she brought the virus home to Evan? With his lifelong asthma, he's no stranger to hospital ERs as a patient. Her eyes fill, she swipes at them and resumes tying her second sneaker. Every day since the crisis began, she strips down to her underwear the minute she crosses the threshold, throws her scrubs in the washing machine, and dashes to the bathroom for a shower before she even kisses him hello. Should she move out of the bedroom, sleep on the air mattress in the tiny study where his computer, his lifeline and livelihood, sits on its sleek minimalist desk? It might be safer for Evan, but it would be so lonely for them both. She tips, tiptoes over to Evan's side of the bed and kisses him goodbye. He stirs briefly and mutters, hmm. What would he do if she didn't make it through the pandemic? How long would it take him to find someone else? She wouldn't want him to be alone, but women like Evan. He's one of those guys who treats the women he works with as true equals and genuinely enjoys their company. And she's pretty sure his friend Megan has a thing for him. She can't believe she has to think about such things. She tosses her head to shake away thoughts of her own non-existence and of being replaced by one of Evan's colleagues. One thing at a time, she tells herself, let's just get through today, okay? Her focus shifts to work as she decants two consecutive cups of Keurig coffee into her travel mug and unwraps a chocolate-filled croissant. She wondered what, wonders what happened to that 45-year-old construction worker she had to intubate right before she left yesterday. Hopefully his oxygen saturation got better after being on the vent for a while. It couldn't have gotten much worse. He was the seventh patient she intubated that day, a personal best. She smiles wryly at this thought. Then a bite of the croissant seizes her complete attention, food having taken an outside pl outsized place in her hierarchy of needs with all the recent stress. Bless those grateful citizens who started bringing pizza and subs to the ER for lunch or dinner. Formerly a haphazard grocery shopper, Evan has really stepped up in the food provision department since he's been working from home, usually fixing healthy meals weighted toward vegetables and meatless protein, but there's always a treat. These luxury baked goods freeze surprisingly well, she tells herself as she licks her lips. Work thoughts intrude again. Now it's the old woman with dementia who came in DOA from the nursing home yesterday. Her clinical presentation had been compatible with COVID-19 for sure. Would the next few days bring an influx of cases from the facility? A shudder courses up her spine. When would those damn N95 masks arrive anyway? They can't keep sterilizing and rotating the ones they have forever. 
And how about more face shields? An old homeless guy coughed right in her face on that night shift earlier in the week. She wanted to slug him. And then she felt guilty about her blind, unreasoning anger. It wasn't his fault he had the virus. She had to wash off the face shield and scrub it down with alcohol instead of discarding it. If it hadn't been for that long suffering sheet of plastic, she'd be screwed for sure. She can't let herself think about the PP, PPE debacle anymore, much less the shortage of ventilators. It makes her too angry. She must marshal all her energy for work, not dissipate it on rage, however appropriate that rage might be. She longs for the days when the things that made her mad were inconvenient schedule changes and inane policy memos from the hospital administration, not colossal screw-ups by the federal government. And the other thing about ventilators, she really can't let herself think about that. The prospect of having to choose who would go on one and who would not, being forced to play God, neither medical school nor residency had prepared her for that. That time has not yet come, thankfully, as of yesterday, there'd been, there'd been a sharp uptick in cases, but they were still waiting for the full force of the tsunami to hit. The ER staff watched tents being set up in the hospital parking lot in the cold rain of March's last days. Then the tent supplies rolling in over the first two, weeks of April, two days of April, waiting and waiting. She'll have to collar the colleague who posted that letter on Facebook about liability in the event any of them died due to lack of PPE. She wants to sign it. Actually, she wants to wave it in the faces of the hospital administrators, her state legislators, the president himself. Nope, mustn't go down that road, she thinks, as she gives her hands one more reflexive 20-second scrub, her poor chapped hands, before pulling on her jacket, fixing her fabric mask in place, and heading out the door. On the brisk six-block six walk to the hospital, she lifts the mask briefly to finish the last few sips of coffee, then stashes the empty travel mug in her messenger bag. Her heart rate accelerates as she considers the coming day. Will she pass the temperature check at the door? She, feel, she feels fine, no reason to think she won't, other than that generalized low-level paranoia, which along with her fear and grief never goes away. How many more charts than yesterday will be waiting for her in the ER? Maybe this will be the day the chaos takes off, running out oppressor medications for shock or blood products or respiratory supplies or all three and or critical numbers of staff out sick. Will this be the day her hospital, her hospital morphs into New York City's Columbia University Irving Medical Center, where her best friend Jenny from medical school works? How's Jenny doing after that tearful phone call the other night, she asks herself. That was the day New York City had almost 9,300 cases, more than tenfold DC's tally. Jenny had to code three patients in as many hours, none of whom made it. Jenny didn't text me yesterday, should I be worried? Now she can see the emergency room entrance. The ambulance bays are full of patients on stretchers. Doctors, nurses, and other staff converge in front of the glass and steel doors, their face masks a panoply of colorful fabric patterns, hunched in their jackets and scarves against the chilly April morning. She swallows hard, her jaw tightens. She squares her shoulders and puts on her game face as she approaches the nurse with a thermometer gun just outside the door. That was great, Kay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love the way you dramatize sort of, um, you know, what was happening last year, especially um, and into this year um, in, a, in a very unique way, which a lot of people were sort of frozen or, or, or um, apprehensive to write about, you know, what was going on, uh, what has been going on, but you tackled it head on. Um, next up, we have Cedric Tillman, who holds a BA in English from UNC Charlotte and uh, also graduated from American U University's Creative Writing MFA program. His debut collection, Lilies in the Valley, was uh, published by Willow Books in 2013. His latest offering, In My Feelings, was published by WordTech in 2019. He currently lives in Northern Virginia. Please welcome Cedric Tillman. Hey everybody, um, glad to be here. Uh, thanks to uh, Caroline and Jonah uh, for putting this together. Um, always happy to see my old classmate, uh, Jonah from AU. Um, so 
um, this poem, uh, I'll read the poem that's in the anthology first and then uh, two other short ones. Um, the poem in the anthology, and I have to apologize to the editors because when I saw it in the book, <clears throat> I said, oh no, I appear to have left, completely left the epigraph out. And when I looked at what I sent you guys, I indeed had left the epigraph out, which I think would um, help somewhat, uh, help somewhat with the, um, you know, understanding the poem. Um, the poem was the result of a confluence of several different articles, as a lot of poems that I write are uh, sort of based or inspired by news articles and things I read. Um, and this particular poem, um, when I wrote it, um, I was reading about Caitlyn Jenner and her transition. And uh, there were, uh, there was an article or, or uh, uh, Kim Kardashian had talked about the difficulty. She was very frank about the difficulty she was having dealing with um, Caitlyn's transition. And um, at the same time, there were things in the news about um, the, I think, is it Kendall Jenner? I forget which one it was, who was dating someone who was considerably older. There was some controversy about that. I think she was 16, he was 25, 24, something like that. And on top of it, at the same time, I, I don't, at the same time, I was reading um, a book, uh, this particular book, and the book is called uh, Martin Luther King, Homosexuality and the Early Gay Rights Movement. Uh, and it's really a fascinating um, book and really in-depth look at um, uh, the, the author speculates about uh, Martin Luther King and uh, where he would be on, on this issue, uh, gay marriage and stuff like that uh, today. Um, and so anyway, so I was re all, this, all this stuff was going on at the same time. So the title of the um, book comes from, uh, the, book, the title of the poem comes from uh, a passage I read in this book. And the um, and it's spoken by Adam Clayton Powell, who's a very famous uh, civil rights activist, uh, quite a personality um, and a really interesting guy, um, former congressman from uh, Harlem. And the, uh, the statement he made, this was uh, published in Ebony Magazine in 1950. He said, um, um, he, he, was, he was talking about homosexuality um, and, uh, uh, you know, a man of his time for sure uh, on the issue. And he said, um, the boys with the swish and the girls with the swagger are getting daily more numerous and more bold. And it is highly necessary that we start doing something to save our young, our growing youngsters from becoming members of the horrible no man's land of sex. So that's where I got the title. Um, and um, with all of that background for this tiny poem, uh, I'll read the poem. Swagger and Swish. The hardest thing the children have ever had to do is watch her get dressed. Now that their father shudders at maleness, now that her needs are inexorable, a shade of skin. The youngest, just now into men and makeup, blooming with potent imprecision. At last, that vexing and obstinate wind leans a fallacy of orchids into submission. Um, I'm gonna read um, one poem, um, a poem that's been published. Yeah, I know, Jonah. I, 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 and I did mention in the thing that I submitted about the poem, I did mention or allude to this. Um, I can't believe I left the epigraph off. Um, but uh, so the second poem I'll read was just published um, recently by uh, Solstice uh, Literary Magazine. And uh, so it's online, um, but uh, the title is um, Absent from the Body. And uh, real briefly, there's an, a, a reference here to Windermere, Florida where um, Officer Derek Chauvin had a um, summer home. Absent from the body. The officer is kneeling on a man's neck 
with the full weight of functional eardrums. When the audience begs for mercy, when he knows it is thoroughly engrossed, he shifts his weight a little for effect, makes eye contact and holds it. What command he displays of this inheritance. Note the capacity for illusion, how it seems he sees the girl with the cell phone. In truth though, he's lost in thought, wondering with all the sickness in the air, if wintering in Windermere is the thing to do this year. And nothing less than that failure of faith could move him to linger so long at this fleshly altar. So profound was his contrition, he could not rise until he had made sacrifice. He makes a balanced beam of panicked blood, makes a silent desecration, but put a man on his face before God long enough and he is bound to cry out for his maker. Um, and finally, I'm gonna read um, one poem from my um, latest collection, um, which is called uh, uh, In My Feelings. And um, this poem is called The Flag. My dad says, I told your mom about that shirt. She don't listen to nobody. Mama not political, so she really don't understand. She's not supposed to be wearing this little t-shirt that says Southern girl with the Confederate flag on it. Mama is a Southern girl for sure. Says she only wears it in the yard tending to her flowers that she dug through a big bag of clothes from Miss Joan, who keeps a sweet lady who keeps kids and that it fit her just fine. And it does. Mama looks right cute in it if you don't think much. We can't make her understand she could be seen. She would never approach Miss Joan about it. And if I see Miss Joan, I won't mention it. Miss Joan also gave her a book, some Langston Hughes poetry, which I read to the babies. If she just gonna be out in the flowers, I don't wanna make a big deal. Thank you all. That was great. Sorry. Thank you so much, Cedric. That was great. Thank you for um, your introduction too. That really helps explain your work and the poem. So um, thank you to uh, Caroline and Jonah for um, putting together this event. Uh, they've been very generous to invite me to read my story as well, which was also included. So I'd like to do that. Um, and it was really a treat to hear all of the authors read their work, but also hear a little bit about, you know, the inspiration behind the work. And um, I will also offer just a little tidbit, a little morsel uh, of the inspiration behind this particular piece. Um, over the last couple of years, I wrote a lot of sort of uh, satirical work, but at the same time, I was working on some sort of more serious probing, um, I guess, gritty realistic work. And this particular piece is my attempt to understand a kind of um, sort of horrible desperation and unshakable anger and frustration behind a very flawed individual. This is a story called The Hill. Why don't you work that hill, Mrs. Witten said. It wasn't a question. She pointed up the slope past the woods towards the miller's cornfield Hexagon, her estate, as she called it then, was just outside of town, but it felt like somewhere else. I hurried to the barn and emerged with the trimmer, slipped my goggles over my glasses and started bushwhacking the hill. It was a sizable job. Mrs. Witten said the kids liked it, best sledding hill in town. She had a generous spirit, I could tell. I'm a decent read of people. She was kindly to her core though she enjoyed the visceral feeling of being in control. I had a half gallon of water and a milk carton sitting in the shade. It was hot and humid, and the gnats peppered me from the woods. Dust and grass thwacked my face. Every molecule in my body told me to get out of there, but I had to think big picture. I had few friends and no respect. My marriage was in ruins, and my daughter was about to turn four. She barely knew me. The only way I could change any of that was to do whatever Mrs. Witten needed me to do, 
money. I felt on edge. And for some reason, my hand shook. She was the key. And the key to the key for that moment was that hot, dusty hill gnarled with thistle and ragweed. My whole life was there. I completed the job as the sun slanted down the horizon. Everything looked silhouetted and beautiful as I walked back to the manor. Mrs. Witten was sitting on the porch drinking iced tea, cold crescents clinking in her glass. Did you finish up already? I did at that, I said. Yes, ma'am. I put everything back where you found it, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, I said. I half bowed. I didn't want to say too much or to ask too many stupid questions. She was, she was already kind enough to bring me on board. I knew she didn't actually need me. I needed her far worse. I put the goggles, gloves, and trimmer back in the barn and stood there for a minute, just feeling the heat radi radiate off me. I was dying for a drink of something cold and a bath. Both would have to wait. Then I called Stevie and he came and got me. We didn't talk much on the ride back. I was glad my efficiency had a window unit, small blessings. I'd been in the pen for 18 months. There were things I would talk about and things I wouldn't talk about. Most wouldn't even find out about the 18 months, but if I knew you well enough, I might give it up. Thing was, I didn't have any real friends, nobody who mattered enough. The friends I did have didn't want to talk to me any longer. They blamed me. I was banned from homes. Talk about a shitty feeling. My family was a help, but even they held me at arm's length. I found out about Mrs. Witten through the moving company I worked for prior. Two months of sweeps across the county, hard labor boy. I was 47 years old and I was having a hard time keeping up with the 20 year olds. My back barked at me. I felt weary around them. And then they found out, which made it harder. We mowed the yard of the Millers and Mr. Miller asked Chuck, our crew chief, if anybody needed some odd jobs. Chuck looked right at me. I was grateful. I'd take all the odd jobs I could get. Work kept me, out of, kept me out of the shadows. At first, it was just weekends on top of the moving company, but then she hired me to do work around the house pretty much full time, she said. Four times a week minus Fridays when she had to be in the city. Handiwork, yard work, everything would be outside, she said. No men inside her house. I'm just not able to do everything, she said. She explained that her husband died two years ago and that she just didn't want to give everything up. I can do little jobs. She knew nothing about me as far as I knew. The next day I was back on site at the normal time. I arrived a bit early, so I waited around until she came out onto the porch. That's the way she liked it. Can we take care of the windows today? Everything you need is out in the shed. She called it the shed. Perhaps this way she would make me feel less insufficient. I found the ladder, Windex, rags, and started in. It was a large undertaking as the manor was an old Victorian with three stories, dormers, and multiple windows. If I was smarter, I would have been scared, but I didn't even think about it. Instead, I watched Mrs. Witten when I could see her. I hadn't at that point been invited inside the house itself. So this was the closest I had come. I memorized the interiors, what I could see. At one point when I was cleaning the sitting room windows, Mrs. Witten walked into the room and sat in a wing-backed armchair she was immersed in looking through a box of photographs, her eyes tight. When she looked up to catch my gaze, I glanced away. I'm sure she had to wonder about me, even though she was a few decades older than I was. She reminded me of something, someone. If she could have seen into my head, she would have known what I had been through. I learned things. I had the ability to, to take everything she had like that. But I knew I had to restrain that impulse with every muscle I had. My cousin Stevie understood me. He had gone through something similar a few years back. We weren't close, but I viewed him as a kind of model. His life was scoured clean, and he patched it back together from the basement up. At that time, he had a decent job at a hardware store where he had worked for several years. There was a day I showed up 15 minutes late. Miss Witten was on the porch waiting for, for me, running her palm along the painted white rail. She must have been beautiful in her own day. I could see that. She kept her hair done up in a bun, and I was thinking it would be better, it would look better down on her shoulders, flowing. Good morning, Ray, she said, and nodded. Are you planning on arriving late frequently? If so, I won't be needing your services, to be perfectly frank. 
I explained what happened or tried to, but she just raised her palm up as if to say, I don't need to hear anymore. So I stopped mid sentence. I truly apologize, I said, it won't happen again. Miss Witten squirreled up her right eye and, sw and swallowed. She told me I needed to help her repaint the shed. This was good news because if I was smart, I could work in the shade for most of the time, I realized. My skin felt leathery and baked in already. I could smell the lilacs around Mrs. Witten's porch. For a moment, I almost felt dizzy from the aroma. It took me five days to prime and then fully paint it and then fully paint, repaint the barn. I wasn't in a hurry. And in fact, I took my time dragging out the process and taking long breaks. I happened to finish on a Friday, which was the day when she was supposed to pay me for my week's work. She had paid the two previous weeks in cash. She did the same that same day. And Stevie was waiting for me. He had no idea. I was standing on the porch steps watching her glass of wine beat up and sweat. I watched the condensation drip onto the table, um, though the stem stayed dry. Something collapsed inside of me. I walked up the stairs and the porch itself, and I felt like forbidden territory, a knot in my gut, white paint and sunshine standing on the manor house proper. I didn't think, I just walked straight into the house. I was sunbaked and needed a cool, dark place. I was inside the foyer, rugs and little statues and paintings on the walls, and I just stood there leaning slightly against the wall. When Mrs. Witten turned the corner, cash in hand, she started. I watched her swallow. Now, what are you doing? I'm hot, I said. Do you have something cold I could drink? But when she reached out to hand me the money, I clutched her wrist instead. I don't know why I did it. Something about her earring sway, something about a tickle in the back of my throat. It felt like an accident, though it wasn't. I knew that. I knew, of course, the mistake I was making, unredeemable. But I was not myself. The sun had fried my good thinking. I was outside of myself. Someone else was operating my body. And where is the rest of it now, I yelled. The other hand rose upward. I could see the shadow of it before I let it fly. There was a moment when I knew I had to stop, that I couldn't still keep this from being the worst thing, but I couldn't. My hand fell and again. She had barely anything, which made it even worse. And I knew I had to leave right away, but I didn't tell Stevie about my misstep. Instead, I asked to hear some blues on the radio, something to calm my nerves but he couldn't find any. The closest was some old Leonard Skinner on a station with lots of ads about jewelry and expensive resorts. I had to drop him off at the bus station. I have to meet someone, I explained. You want me to wait? I can wait. No, go on, I'll get a lift. I had enough for a ticket in the middle of the country. I had done plenty wrong in my life and it was time to pay. I bought a hamburger at the fast food stand inside the station and boarded the bus. No bags, I shook my head, only invisible ones, I thought. But two weeks later, I was under wraps all over again. I laid low, grew a beard, slept out under the stars in the woods and caves. I bought some cheap sunglasses and avoided public places. I snuck into town to buy food at the little grubby market. It was no way to live. I still don't know how they found me. Might've been my phone. I should have tossed that thing in the station garbage, garbage can when I had the chance. Just that thin little filament is all they needed, I guess. Too bad. Part of me was almost thankful though. I was down to my last couple of dollars and getting the runs bad, drinking from the creek out back when I became desperate. Even though I knew where I was headed, I also knew they had to feed me and there was a sink. I could drink as much water as I liked, which is all I wanted. Someday I'd count my blessings and be a good man, I thought. I was in the car and the blue lights were whirling. I don't know why they already had me. It wasn't an emergency. I felt the cool air conditioning against my cheek and I had a pebble in my mouth to keep my saliva going until I could drink something. They didn't take that from me, oddly. I said nothing, turning my tongue over the stone over and over. Thank you all so much for the great reading and uh, thanks to Jonah and Caroline for putting it together and accepting all this work that we heard. And uh, big thanks to the authors. Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like, if you just wanna, you know, give a shout out and say hello and- um, Thank you everyone.
Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Everything thank is you great. Everybody. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Well. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to my son, Theo, for to Naomi thank and you. Miles and other friends who are here. And thank, thank you, you. Jonah and Caroline. And this thank you, Lay Layla, for coming in, zooming in from Australia. Yeah. Wow. Surprise for farthest travel, <laughs> Yes. Hey, no worries. It was fun. Thanks everyone for reading. Yeah. So glad you came and thanks to everybody who came. What a great thing. What fun. Fun day. Yeah. Hey. See everybody again soon, I hope. See you soon. See everybody. Outside. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. This Thank is you. what America Bye. looks Bye. like. Bye. Woo! -hoo! That's right. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, Caroline. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, I'm glad you. We Thank, you. Off. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. Thank you guys for having me. Bye. Bye, -bye, -bye guys. Thank Terrific you. reading. Thanks. Really nice. Really nice job, Kay. I loved hearing your voice in that story. Thank you. <laughs> really did. Nathan, you wrote one powerful piece for this. I hope you know that too, my Thank friend. You. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was uh, probably not the happiest ending, but <laughs> yeah, I mean that that story was a punch in the gut. That was fantastic. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. No, that's the first time I read it, so it's kind of <laughs> these are desperate times, and you wrote about a desperate man. Yeah, kind of like my uh, my take on like a Bruce Springsteen song or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what I was thinking about in the back of my head. Back of my head was, you know, some kind of, you know, dusty Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan kind of right thing. from original Born to Run album. Exactly. So do, you, do you often write with soundtracks in mind? No, not 